All right. I'm just going to wait a moment um, for uh, people to join in, and uh, then I'll, I'll get started. So, all right. Make sure that this is situated so that everybody can see it. Okay, let's see here. All right. Well, uh, welcome back to the second Curator Live, the Chats with the Curator. Um, I'm going to actually be doing this every uh, Monday at 2 o'clock, um, and I got a pretty good response last time, um, and so uh, we'll keep it going. Um, today I got some really, really cool stuff to show you, some really, really interesting things. Um, and uh, the first thing, uh, obviously, that I'm going to show you that's sort of sitting right here is kind of, it's kind of hard to miss, isn't it? Um, is this large punch bowl. Um, this is a punch bowl that was made by a firm called Furnival and Sons. Um, the firm was uh, in the 1800s, was, was manufactured, it was started in the 1800s. Um, and this punch bowl, date wise, it didn't actually belong to James Rudd, it, it more likely belonged to his grandson or to his son, excuse me. So um, this would have been passed down to the family. Um, it would have been a cherished possession. And according to our records, they were well aware. Of, of that it belonged to the Monroe family and the, and the significance of it um, as it passed down through. So so what's going on here? What, what is this thing? What, what's, what's happening? Um, obviously a large punch bowl uh, used for occasions, uh, for, for fancy dining, things like that. But uh, we all sort of, in fact, a lot of families now may have something very similar to this. Um, so this is not something that has disappeared in time. This is not an artifact that has gone away. Um, this is something that, that, that we have, have recycled over and over again um, with our you know, punch bowls and fancy decorations and things like that. Um, so with this one in particular, it, it's pretty cool. Uh, how is it made? Uh, well, how do they make this thing? Well, uh, they would turn it on a wheel, actually, believe it or not. A lot, today, a lot, of the, a lot of the bowls are made from press. Uh, they're made through a manufacturer line where, you know, they, they have uh, slabs of clay and then they press it down and they, and they do it in. Or it's made through casting, um, which uh, they would uh, pour liquid clay into a pre-made cast or a pre-made um, uh, 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 plaster of Paris uh, mold. And they would pour it in there and they would create it that way. And so that's where a lot of them are done. And they actually... Oh hey hey Nathan, um, and they're actually uh, they're actually uh, still do that today. So to this day, they still do the molds and everything. In fact, that's quite common. Um, but for this one in particular, they would have put it on a wheel and they would have raised it up. So he would have slapped it down on the wheel. Uh, the potter would have uh, put the big big old slab of clay, and then he would have centered it as the wheel goes around, and he would have centered it, centered it. And then he would have put his thumbs in and he would have slowly dragged it out and slowly dragged it out till it got bigger and bigger and then go up and everything. This one is a creamware, um, which is a little bit different. And Furnival and Sons is part of a vast collective of, of potteries known as Staffordshire. Um, and so it's kind of cool because uh, you know, today we always hear about Staffordshire. It's like, well, what, is, what exactly is Staffordshire. What is it? We always hear about it, but what exactly is it? Well, um, it's part of, it's a vast collective of English potteries. It's, it's, it's an area. Um, it's not, a, it doesn't actually refer specifically to a specific pot, to a specific potter or a specific firm. It's actually it refers to an area, a collective of potters. Um, and it's in England. And it actually rose up in the mid 18, in, in the mid 18th century. Um, or excuse me, uh, in the mid 1800s. And it, uh, it, it was actually sitting, that whole area is sitting on this giant deposit of clay. So it's actually, the whole area is sitting on this big deposit of clay. And um, the potters sort of, sort of gathered around that area, sort of was drawn to that, to that place. So they can dig the clay out themselves. You know, back then they just go and dig them out, dig out the clay. And then around the 1840s in there, um, they added a, a mixture of flint calcinite that, that actually sort of gave this distinctive creamware. Um, which is, is what this is, um, and sort of the distinctive texture to it. Um, a lot of you may have heard the, you may have heard the, uh, um, of Wedgwood, right? Uh, the Ansley, Wedgwood. Uh, well, Wedgwood is part of, a, of the Stratfordshire, of the Staffordshire uh, Collective. So, like I said, when you think of Staffordshire, it's not actually a specific pottery. 
it's, a, it's actually referring to the area and the collective of it. And the creamware itself was a distinctive sort of uh, style of that area. They started doing other things like ironware, uh, things like that later on. And then this is the result. Um, so this, and I don't know if you could see up there, so I actually brought a picture. But something I wanted to talk to you in particular about this piece is that it has a lot of what's called crazing on it. Um, and so crazy, it, it, crazy is actually, it's, it's, it's these little cracks. And I've, I've pulled up a picture. So this is a larger version. This is actually a section of this pot right here. That's what this is. And so I brought this here for you so you can see a closer look. And what I'm talking about is I'm talking about these little cracks that you see. And a lot of times you'll see those in your old pottery. So some of you, oh, hey, Honor, how are you? So some of you may have um, uh, old pottery that you had around for the generations you had around. And they actually have cracks in it like this, this crazing in it. Um, and so you're like, well, what is that? Why does that exist? What's happening? Well, I'll tell you exactly what it is. Um, the first thing I'll say is that you actually can still use the pot. You can, you, if you have this on an old bowl, you had this on an old uh, a piece of por porcelain from back in the day, you can still use it. Don't worry about it. These cracks are actually not part of the body of the pottery itself. These are not. These are actually separate from the body. Um, these are actually part of the glaze that is over top of this pot. And what happened is, I don't know if you can. You, uh, hopefully, you can see that pretty well. Um, what has happened is. As if, if the pottery and the glaze weren't exactly quite in mesh whenever they were firing it, they actually, oh, hey, Tara, hey, Tara. they actually, um, whenever over time, uh, through various temperatures and fluctuations and things like that, I mean, you're going to get temperatures and humidity, and this happens, this is a period over time, the clay body itself will, the clay will, will shrink and expand and do all this sort of thing, and it will do that in a different way than the glaze. So the glaze is actually set in a different way than the body itself. And so what happens is, and they don't like that, they don't like that very much. So you have the body sort of shrinking in and shrinking out, and then you have the glaze over top of it not reacting well to that and going, hey, what's going on? And so over time, you start to develop these little tiny, interesting, and again, I'll sort of pull this up, interesting sort of cracks that happen into the, the body itself into the into the piece. So that's what's happening when you see this on the old pottery. Uh, so don't worry about that. Um, in a lot of cases that actually, in my opinion, you know, I think it sort of adds character to the, I think it adds character to the piece. I think it's kind of cool. But, you know, it's up to you. It's it's in the eye of the beholder and it's your piece. So you can actually still use them even if they have um, cracks like this. So, and what I'll do is I'm going to actually move this big, this big fella over a little bit. And I'll show you a little bit about uh, the differences between the different types of pottery. Um, so this is a creamware, uh, and it's actually it's sort of a, it's, here, let me move this over, actually. And I'll bring up this other piece. I just want to lug this whole thing over. And here, oh, let me get this here for you. All right. Okay. What I have here is I have the different types of pottery. Um, I have an earthenware. This is an earthenware pot. And, uh, and I have a stoneware pot. And then I have a porcelain pot. And these are all the same size. Um, and I know that you can't feel it at home, but I'll, I'll sort of describe the differences here. Um, I actually made these. Um, I, I pulled them out in a wheel and I fired them. I do some pottery on the side. And um, the earthenware pot, all it is, all, people wonder, well, what's the difference between earthenware and between stoneware and porcelain? What exactly is the difference? Well, really, a lot of the main difference, of course, you have clay difference, but really the, the deciding factor in a lot of it is the temperature at which it's fired. So when we're looking at this, we're looking at, you know, the difference between well, earthenware and stoneware why, what's the difference? Well, it's really the temperature at which it's fired. And don't worry, and, and there are clays that are specific to different types. So there's some clays that do better with earthenware, some clays that are very specific to porcelain, to be fired to porcelain. So the earthenware is fired up to about generally below 21,000 degrees. Uh, 21,000, excuse me. 2,100 degrees. 21,000, that's, that's, that's a bit extreme, don't you think? Uh, uh, 2,100 degrees. Fired below that, you're generally going to get an earthenware. And so the earthenware is going to be a little bit rougher um, in feel whenever you pick one up and you feel it. Oh, hey, Lux, how are you, man? Um, you, 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 the, it's going to be a little bit different. Um, and so it's going to uh, 
feel different to you. And then you have the stoneware right here, which is fired between 2010 to about uh, 2300, 2370 around there. Um, and uh, this is actually, uh, and Lux, you may actually have some of these at home, some of these uh, stoneware. Um, stoneware is going to be a little bit more solid feeling, if that makes sense. Um, it's, it, whenever you pick it up, it just has a little bit more of a, of a toughness to it, a little bit more of a, of a thick skin, so to speak. I know it's a little strange, but yeah, it, it's a little bit more of a thick skin. Um, and there, the difference between, one of the big differences between the two, the earthenware and the stoneware, hey Blake, um, is that the stoneware is going to be vitrified. And what I mean by vitrified is that the stoneware is actually going to be a water, uh, it's going to be able to contain water. So if I were to pour water into here, and I'll just let, let it sit down, I was going to let the earthenware sit down, and then I was going to pour water into the stoneware, and I would just let it sit down, you know, just let it sit. Eventually, the water would start to leak out the bottom. You'll see it. It would actually start to sort of flow out the bottom of the, of the pot. Whereas in the stoneware, it's not going to do that. It's going to stay in. So that's an important thing to know, especially historically. So historically, when you look at these old pots and you look at old uh, or old ceramics, um, you see, you know, if an oil lamp or everything, it's probably going to be more likely going to be stoneware because with oil lamps, a lot of times those oil ones are earthenware, but it's going to leak out. So they're going to be glazed somehow. Um, and the stoneware, what's important to know about that is that and I, maybe I can show this next week, but um, the, those old blue and gray storage crocks that you see in every single antique show ever, or in, in, in all, all the antique stores, you always see those old blue and gray, gray American stoneware storage pots. You see them everywhere, and they're all stoneware. And the reason for that is because it can be vitrified, and it can hold the water. So it can be able to hold the storage a lot better. And then you have, of course, our good friend, porcelain. Uh, porcelain is is fired much higher. It's going to be between uh, twenty two thousand and uh, I just get twenty two thousand two thousand two hundred and two thousand six hundred degrees. So think about that, two thousand six hundred degrees. You're starting to get close to smelting temperature. That that's a whole lot. Um, for earthenware, uh, if you stuck an iron in there, uh, a piece of iron, that's going to be glowing hot for sure. This is going to be you're getting well past welding temperature for steel. So if you think about that, the welding temperature for steel is going to be below what's fired for porcelain. So those kilns are going to get hot, right? Those suckers are going to get hot. So porcelain, um, but the great thing about porcelain is, of course, it's completely vitrified. And it's also a lot more glassy, a lot more delicate feeling, um, a more refined feel to it. It just has that feel, um, if you know what I mean. Oh, hey, Holly, how are you? Um, it's good to see you. Um, and so whenever you have porcelain as compared to, sto to stoneware or compared to earthenware, um, you're going to generally see this in the more high-end products for ceramics. And that is something that hasn't changed. Um, that's something that's very true today. So in the old, uh, in the English potteries and in the French potteries, a lot of the higher-end porcelain and a lot of the higher-end ceramics, they're going to be mostly porcelain. And I will qualify that by saying that there is a difference between soft paste porcelain and hard paste porcelain. And whenever you see, and what am I talking about? Well, whenever you see, um, you go on, on TV and you see the Antiques Roadshow or something like that, and they show an old piece of pottery from Paris. It's super fancy decorated and it has all this wonderful carvings and all this sort of thing on there. And it, and it was a high-end piece. That's more likely going to be a hard paste porcelain, which is closer to true porcelain. And, and... Then if you see ones that are a little bit more commonplace, um, use a little bit more utilitarian, a lot of times those are soft paste porcelain. And I know that's saying strange. Oh, hey, Brady, how are you? Um, and um, so that seems a little strange, but you actually can sort of tell the difference. So if you go into your into your China cat, if you have a, a, a set of China that was passed down uh, through the generations, um, and uh, you can look at it, and if it has a little bit more of a cream kind of feel to it, a little bit softer feel to it, there's chances of soft paste porcelain. And in fact, oh, side note, a lot of people want to, want to know why we call it China, um, the porcelain piece as well, because uh, back in the day, uh, the porcelain in the early, early, um, uh, you know, the 1700s, 1600s, uh, the porcelain that was the, the, the hard paste or the true porcelain was coming from China. 
So that's that's why that's why it's called that, and it's sort of passed on. And in fact, uh, Europe um, tried to do its own porcelain for many many years, and they tried to make all these different recipes. And believe it or not, this is true. They actually had alchemists working on on the formula, and eventually they actually got something pretty close to porcelain um, in the early days. And so that was the soft paste porcelain. And then as time went on, uh, they 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 ended up getting a really solid formula, and they actually started doing true porcelain. So again, to sum up, um, before I move on to the next piece, to sum up, uh, you have earthenware, which is fired below 2100 degrees, and that's the difference. And you have, and then you have stoneware, which is going to be fired um, generally below 20, uh, 2300 degrees, 2370 degrees. And then you have porcelain, which is fired all the way up from 2300 all the way up to 2600 degrees. So you have different firing temperatures. Let me show you this. I brought up a, a picture here. This is a picture of an old Staffordshire, when I was talking earlier, the old Staffordshire furnaces, and so uh, the kilns. And so these are kilns, and actually th this one actually is still there today. So if you ever get over to that area in England, you can actually, I think you can still check it out. Um, but as you can see, they're just huge, big old pieces of brick that, you know, brick structures that they fire these things and they have, uh, you know, tons and tons of pieces that go through. So the Staffordshire area was very much a manufacturing area, even back in the day. And they were churning these things out because there was a huge demand for porcelain and for these sort of products, um, maybe a little bit cheaper than importing it all the way from China. So, and don't worry for folks that are tuning in later, I'll go back over this um, at the end as a summary. But I wanted to bring out this next piece here. I'll see if I can move this. Um, I wanted to bring out this next piece because this was actually a request. Um, and if you have requests for artifacts that you want to see in the, in, the, in the coming ones, please do. Feel free to do that. But this was a request from someone online that wanted to see a sword. They said, do you have any swords? And I said, yes, I do have a sword. And I can't talk about that. Um, I'm going to pull this out. This is really, really cool. So I hope you guys like this. You pull out the sword you do it very carefully, okay? And this, if I can get this out, this is James Monroe's small sword. And I'm going to see, I'm going to try to get it up there a little bit closer, if you can see it. There's the hilt, okay? Then all the way up through the blade. And then I'm going to show you all the way down through the end. There you go. Now this is a magnificent piece. Um, it really is, and I'll tell you why. Um, several reasons. Number one, this sword belonged to a founding father president and was, you know, there's a very good chance it was worn over in Europe whenever he was doing his diplomatic missions. And diplomatically, uh, he was, he was, uh, he would attend the court of Napoleon. So there's a very good chance that he wore this in the court of Napoleon. So you have a you have a sword that belonged to a founding father president, possibly worn in the court of Napoleon. That's pretty cool. I mean, come on, that's that's pretty cool. So let me talk specifics about this thing. So why is it called a small sword? Why is it not a rapier? Why is it not a broad sword? Why is it not a basket hilt? Why? Well, the, 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 when they call it a small sword, that's the name that came up simply because it was a little bit smaller than rapiers, but it doesn't actually mean that it's a tiny little miniature sword that's sort of for decoration. That's not what that means. Um, in fact, I have a good friend, Larry, who is, he's a, he's a sword combat uh, um, choreographer, and his small swords here, they can do a whole, it, the ones that he has, he likes rapiers, but the ones he has can do a whole lot of damage if they wanted to. So these were not purely decorative. However, having that said that, what's kind of cool about it is that in some ways they kind of were decorative um, because what they were saying was they were saying that I'm a gentleman of stature and I belong in this room with other gentlemen of stature and um, I have the sword here to sort of show off my gentlemanness of stature. Um, so it's sort of like wearing an expensive Rolex watch in some ways. Um, you know, we're sort of showing that you had a bit of a status. Let me show you, for people that are just tuning in, let me show you a little bit closer. So whenever you see one of these, um, so if people look at it, they might think to themselves, well, you know, it's not as big as like a, you know, a big claymore or, or a big old uh, two-handed sword that I see on, on, on movies. Um, would it really do a lot of damage? Um, and the answer is absolutely it would. You have yourself a big old piece of steel 
This is probably a carbon content of around 1060, something like that. And it's fast, it's light. And so if you got into conflict, you could absolutely, hey, Blake, you could absolutely do a lot of damage with this and you can absolutely kill somebody. Um, yeah, that's very true, Nathan. It, it really does. It's amazing. Um, the sword, and specifically with it, uh, the sword itself has a cast handle. So I don't know if you can see this. Um, Oh, thank you so much, Andy. I appreciate it. Um, if you can see it, it's actually a cast on there, so it's not built from scratch in, 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 the, in the sense that it was carved down. Nope. It was actually cast um, iron, and, and so it was placed around into the furl. How they would make this is they would forge the blade out first, okay? So you have the basic shape of the blade. I don't. You probably won't be able to see it, but maybe I can show you a little bit. If you can look kind of closely, and I'll, I'll turn it a little bit, it actually has a triangle shape to it. So it's sort of a triangle. That gives a little bit more stiffness. See, can you see this up here? Um, up on the top, this sort of ridge going down. Um, and if I turn it this way, you can see the inside. It sort of it looks like sort of a long fuller on the inside here. Um, so the back part of it would give a good ridge. And so it would give it that sort of steady feel to it. So what if you could, you know, fling it around? Because if you're in combat, you're not going to be standing still, right? You're going to be, you're going to be moving it. Um, so you're going to want this to be as strong as possible. They would forge the blade out so that there would be a hardness to it, but also a flexibility. That's very important to know when you're looking at these swords. Um, you want that flexibility. Hey, Matt, what's going on, Matt? Um, and you want that flexibility in there so that it doesn't break. And if it does get damaged, that it would bend rather than break. Okay, so that's really, really important to know. That you want a sword blade, especially for these real, these are actual, could be used combat sword blades. You want them to be flexible yet hard. Well, how do you do that? How do you make it flexible yet also have a, have a hard edge to it? How can you do that? Well, that's in the heat treat process. So they would forge this out, right? They'd get it more or less to shape. And then this is just the blade itself that I'm talking about. And then they would dunk it in an oil quench of some kind. Um, oh, hey, <laughs> hey, bro. Um, and they would, they would dunk it into an oil quench of some kind. And that would, what that would do, they would, they would heat it up red hot to about maybe 1600 degrees in there somewhere, 1650. Um, and you would see it would be sort of a cherry red, the heat of it. And then they would dunk it into the oil quench. And they would pull it out. Now, whenever they immediately pull it out of the oil quench, it's going to be super hard, super hard, almost to the point of being brittle. You don't want that. You know, you don't want that for any hard steel. You don't want that for any knife edge um, and so or any blade at all. So you have the initial process, which is the, the initial dunk. And then you have uh, and, you, and you pull it out and the initial quench. And it's going to be nice and really, really super hard. And so how do you get rid of that but retain the hardness? Well, then you do what's called tempering it. So you actually temper the blade by bringing it up to, for a, for a sword, you're probably going to want to go above 470 degrees, um, somewhere around there, maybe between 470, 500 degrees, uh, maybe even a little bit more. Um, uh, and you'll be able to tell whenever it starts to temper because you'll start to, it'll start to turn uh, yellow. The, the metal itself will start turning yellow, and then it'll start turning uh, a little bit more blue, a little bit green, and then it'll start going to blue. Um, and so you're tempering out the blade. So what you have then is you have yourself a sword that um, can be really, really strong and hard, but you also have a sword that's flexible for combat because you're going to want it that way. You don't want it to snap, right? You want it to break. And so if you took a sword that's properly heat treated and you bent it in a vise, the ideal would be so that the sword would bend at an L shape and sort of spring a little bit back, but not actually snap. And so that's what you have with a sword like this. Um, and sort of real briefly, uh, if you look at Japanese swords, um, the sword itself, the edge and the back, there's going to be a line called a hammond that's in between. And that's because they're doing a similar process with um, clay hardening. And that's something I can get into maybe another time. But um, so you have the, you have the hard uh, edge and the softer back. So they had the cast. And so once you have the sword forged out, you have a tang that runs through. And the tang, if, if you can imagine the sword without its grip on it, um, and you have the, the, the tang running all the way through, you have the cast grip. And if you can see on the end here, you have a little tiny silver ferrule. Those are called ferrules. And they come up here. This part is called the guard. So this is the guard. Just guard your hand in combat. That's always a good thing to have. 
the hilt. Um, this is called a D grip right here. Um, you see different types of grips. Some grips you have a basket hilt grip. If you see those in the Scottish swords, if you guys know what I'm talking about, it's like this basket hilt. And it actually kind of looks like a basket. It really does. It looks like a good old basket. Um, and so this is a, a D grip here. Um, some that are, are some of the swords that you had in the early days, um, they would have a little bit more of a kink to them, a little bit more of a shape. Some of those might be called stirrup grips, um, a little bit different. And then you have the pommel on the end. And so the pommel is what sort of holds this all the the grip and the tang and, and the guard up onto the sword itself so they would slide the tang through the guard okay if you can imagine that inside is sort of sliding through and then uh, they would attach the different elements you would attach the guard you attach the the um the the the, the d grip uh, or the and, and you would attach the the uh the grip or excuse me the grip to itself um and then you would attach the pommel and the pommel on the end a lot of times what they would do, if it does, sometimes it, sometimes it would screw on, sometimes it wouldn't, sometimes, mostly it's going to be peened on the end. So the tang would extend a little bit past the pommel, and then they would peen it on. They would, they would sort of like tap it on, and that would sort of just solidify everything on here. In a lot of cases on these, on these grips, um, there would be glue of some kind in the middle. Uh, these days they use JB Weld or something like that. But back in the day, there was various epoxy, various glues that they could use this. They did have glue back in the day. Some of them could be honestly made out of horse, of horse glue. Um, and they, they could do that also to give it that extra sort of solidification. Um, but if it's properly peened on there, you wouldn't necessarily have to do that. So you wouldn't necessarily have to have it. Um, uh, and to use any sword require a grip. <laughs> oh, oh. That's it. Oh, look at you. That fun. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, so that's what's happening with this. So you have a nice solid grip and then you'd have this. And so a gentleman like James Monroe back in the day would have this as a particular status. And something else I'll just talk about really briefly that's kind of cool about this sword and specifically related to James Monroe is if you look at it, it's a very nicely done sword, right? It's very, it's very well decorated, the good casting on it, it's really, really well made. But it's not crazily over excessive, it's not extreme, it's not super gaudy, it doesn't have like like massive amount of jewels, like, um, you know, uh, uh, the sword from uh, Princess Bride, you know, something like that. Um, it doesn't have a massive amount of decoration on it, and you would see swords like that uh, back in the day. Oh, hey Matthew, how are you? Um, you would see swords like that back in the day, um, where especially like in the European courts, they might have a little bit more decoration to them, a little bit more of a flamboyance. Well, this sword is nice. It's really well done. It's solid and it's well decorated, but it's not over the top. It's a little bit almost humble in comparison to some of the other swords that they might have seen in the courts back then. And that's very, very James Monroe. What am I talking about? Well, a good way to put that is in early America, um, especially around James Monroe's era of public life. So we were talking, you know, let's just say around the 1800, around 1800, around that time period, um, about 1800. Um, the U.S. was really trying to find its own style. It was really trying to find its own voice in the world. Um, a lot of people thought we would fail still at that point, even though it was a couple decades after the Revolutionary War. We were trying to find our own style, our own voice in the world. And so we would say to Europe in particular that we belong in your court. We belong there, but we, or we, we, be, we belong uh, to be considered on the same plane as you, but we are not you. We are different. We are something else. We're something unique. And that's very, very early America. And so, in, 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 and this has a two part to it. And, and so the first part of it is that this is very much saying to, to the Europeans and to the European court when James Monroe was a diplomat over to Europe that I belong in the room with you. I'm not, you know, just a, like, it's like the commonplace or whatever, you know, they, that they might have scoffed upon, but I'm not one of you. I have my own style. Um, I, I, I'm not going to exactly copy what you do. So it's kind of interesting. Um, and the second part of that is James Monroe himself was very, um, he was very refined, but he was also uh, he believed in a certain humility in his look, in his dress, in the way that he presented himself. He believed in a certain humbleness, and that's reflected in a lot of the clothes that we have. And I can bring—I'll bring some out in a next in another curator chat. 
um, and it's reflected in his own personal style and his own personal dealings. In fact, well into later into his life, he was still wearing sort of uh, revolutionary period clothing, um, <laughs> not not from the period, but like sort of that style. Um, and so this was very reflective of James Monroe's personal style. This was saying, I belong in the room with you, but I'm not one of you. And, and I am I am elegant and I am uh, accomplished, but I'm not uh, but I'm humble. I'm also humble. And that's what this is saying. And that's what I think is really, really cool about artifacts, because they can tell you many different stories. Think about that. Oh, hey, Michael, uh, think about that. All the different all the different stories that an artifact, think about all the stories that this one tells you. It tells you how it was made. It tells you the manufacturing process of back in the day. It tells you why they might have carried a sword back in those days, um, the reasons for it, for one. And let's go over that. For one, uh, a fashion sense, um, it was sort of a status symbol. But also, and this is true, there was a really good, decent chance that James Monroe might have gotten into a fight, into a sword fight with somebody. That happened back in the day. As you all know, dueling was a thing. In fact, we have a wonderful video on our YouTube channel right now where Joanne Freeman and Scott Harris and our bully scholars talk about dueling and, and the dueling process of James Monroe. I highly recommend you go to our YouTube channel. Just plug in James Monroe Museum to YouTube and it will come up. Um, and dueling was a thing. Uh, granted, in James Monroe's time, sword dueling wasn't it, was, it wasn't as, as prevalent as it was before, but it still could happen. It still is possible to happen. So, excuse me. So you, so you did have a possibility of James Monroe getting into a sword fight. He could have. Um, probably not. It's probably not going to happen. But there was a possibility. So you wanted a sword that was fashionable and functional and made a statement, but it could also be used if you could possibly do it. And one more time, I'll show you sort of this beautiful sword. I'll pull it back a little bit. You can see it. It's absolutely gorgeous. Let me show you the sheath for it right now. Here's the sheath. There's the end of the sheath, the cap on the end. A ring there to hold it to a belt or to a, attach it to him in some way. And then you can see it has sort of the... Oh this, is, oh, this is a great way to show what I was talking about earlier with the triangle blade. Remember when I was saying that the sword had a triangle blade? Well, if you can you, can you see the end of this? This is reflective of the blade. It's sort of a triangle. It truly is. And, that, and the reason for that is flexibility and for also to give it a little bit of stiffness. And the way they can do this leather is they would just mold it out whenever it's wet and then they'd let it dry and it molds into the shape. So there you go. So the sheath. Okay. All right. So let me review what I've done earlier. Let me, let me just go over it for because there's a lot of folks sort of joining in a little bit later. And so let me review. Um, I'll bring this big fella over. Be very careful. Here it is, the, the punch bowl. For those that are tuning in later, this is the punch bowl uh, made by Furnival and Sons. Um, it's a creamware that was uh, made in the Staffordshire area of England. And once again, to review, the Staffordshire area is a collective of potteries. That's the name of the area. Um, and so, whenever you and, and think of Wedgwood, whenever you think of Wedgwood, um, that's a Staffordshire pottery, and I know a lot of people have Wedgwood pieces. Um, so, uh, again, it, it wasn't a single potter, it was actually a collective of potters. Um, and it's a big old, big old punch bowl, and to review what I was talking about, you, it has this crazing on here, um, and you can see it. Here's a close-up of these cracks. And what that is, is the difference between the, over time, these cracks develop um, if the glaze and the body of the ceramics are not in conjunction. Um, and, and over time, the, the humidity and, uh, and the temperature goes back and forth on the body of the piece. And then, the, uh, then the, the glaze itself does not react well to that. And so over time, um, and uh, yes, you could eat some good ramen out of this, Mike. It's, <laughs> it's very, very true. Um, you have the glaze of this and then you have the, uh, and so over time, it develops these cracks. And for you at home, um, if you have pieces that have these on here, you see it's pretty obvious when you see it. It looks almost like a crocodile, kind of has, has this really, really distinctive look. Um, you can still use it. It's not cracked in the body of the piece. It's just cracked on the glaze itself. Um, so you can still use your piece if, if, if you want to. Um, so that's what that is. And then let me pull this over for you. Let me just move this. And then I'll bring, and to review this for those just joining in, you have earthenware, and you have stoneware, 
and you have porcelain. And really quickly, uh, the difference between them um, is, is some of it is in the clay, but a lot of it is in the firing. So earthenware is fired uh, below 2100 degrees usually. Stoneware is going to be fired between uh, two, you know, 2000 and, two, uh, and 2370 degrees, somewhere in there. And then porcelain is fired all the way up to 2600 degrees. And the difference is with, with earthenware, it's not going to be vitrified, so you're going to have water pass through. That's important to know historically when you look at artifacts. Um, and the reason for that is because if it's an earthenware pot or the thing was, if it's earthenware, then it was meant to be used for uh, some kind of liquid process or something like that, usually. Um, and so because once it's stoneware, then it's vitrified and the water doesn't go through. Same exact thing with with porcelain. Porcelain is very much waterproof. It's vitrified um, and uh, it goes and, and it's a little bit more refined, a little bit more. Um, for lack of a better word, if you look at it a little, a little bit more uh, classy, I guess, if you could say, although in my opinion, there's not much difference, but, um, uh, and, and the porcelain is going to be what you see when you see all those super fancy antique uh, pottery pieces from Paris, those old porcelain pottery pieces. That's what that's going to be. Um, so anyway, uh, we've been on for a while and thank you all so much for watching. I really, really appreciate it. This has been great. Um, and thank you for all your wonderful comments. And like I said, um, we do have some wonderful videos also on our, U on our, on our YouTube channel. Oh, hey, Pam, how are you? It's nice to see you. Uh, or nice to, thank you for joining. Um, and uh, I appreciate all of those. Oh, and to review one more time with the sword, so I can go over that again. Oh. Let me bring this in. This wonderful piece, once again, this is called a small sword. It's the difference between... The rapier and the small sword, all right, I'm going to nerd out for a bit, I'm sorry, um, but the rapier was sort of the ancestor of the small sword. Um, the rapier was a little bit heavier, it was harder. The rapier is what you're seeing when you're seeing three musketeers, okay? Um, it's going to be a thicker blade, um, it's going to be heavier, um, it's going to be you know bigger, a little stronger. Um, small sword is lighter, it's faster. Um, in fact, if I'm not mistaken, it's been many years, there's a wonderful fight at the end of Roy Rod, uh, what is it? The movie with Liam Neeson, um, I forget what they called it, it uh, but it, at, the, at the end there's a battle um, and uh, it's between a basket hilt and a, and a small sword. And if I'm not mistaken, and the small sword is just so much faster. So that's what this is. So this would have been considered a, a decoration as well as a utilitarian piece. And once again, I'll just sort of show this. And that's what that is. And Mike, you like that? <laughs> okay. Well, thank you so very much for joining in. Uh, we'll be posting this on, on our page in case you want to go back and maybe you're homeschooling. Um, yeah, oh, Rob Roy, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Rob Roy. Yes, you guys are right. But I, I, if I'm not mistaken, I think he's using this. It's been many years, but I think he's using a small sword, right? And Rob Roy against uh, Rob Roy's uh, basket hilt, if I'm not mistaken. And it's a wonderful sort of juxtaposition of the two styles. And you know, it's very, you know, the basket is very heavy and this is very light and very strong. Um, but anyway, uh, yeah, you can, you can always go back and, uh, thank you so much. Uh, the next one is going to be, um, the next one is going to be next Monday at two o'clock. I'm going to always join, uh, <laughs> I don't know about that honor. Um, the next one is going to be Monday at two o'clock. So I'm just going to always do these at Monday at two o'clock. So thank you so much for joining. And again, we'll be posting these. Thank you y'all. I appreciate it.